Hi guys, how you doing? Forrest here with Fofo Astro. Uh, today I wanna to take a look at one of those things that I think is probably one of the most helpful tools for a beginning astrophotographer when it comes to planning out what you wanna shoot. So I know for me, one of the hardest things that I struggled with when I was just beginning was looking at all of the celestial bodies up in the sky and knowing which ones would be good to shoot with a DSLR and which ones wouldn't be. And it's really hard to know like A, is the object bright enough? B, is it big enough with my 70 to 200 millimeter lens that I can actually capture something useful? And really trying to find those suitable targets is pretty difficult. So what I wanna to do today is look at a program called Stellarium, which is free for everybody. It's a free download. It's a great, fantastic program. We're gonna look at a couple things. One, how to set up equipment in Stellarium. So you're basically teaching Stellarium how uh, wide or narrow your field of view in your camera lens combination is. And number two, how you go about using Stellarium to pick usable targets for astrophotography when it comes to filtering for things like brightness. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna dive in, look at those settings in Stellarium, get it downloaded. There's a link down in the description so you guys can follow along and I'll catch you on the flip side. All right, you guys, so now I've got Stellarium fired up and a quick couple notes on Stellarium. Number one, mine is configured uh, the way that I like it. We're gonna go through most of those configurations tonight, but a lot of the configuration options in Stellarium just come down to personal preference. So I'm not gonna talk about those. I'm gonna talk about the main ones like we talked about for equipment and also for ensuring that the objects you see in Stellarium are roughly suitable for what you can get with a DSLR. So that's kind of gonna be our goal for the night. Um, other thing is Stellarium is a little bit of a resource hog. So if you have a slower computer, Stellarium might not run as well for you, but I'm gonna do my best to, um, you, you just have to deal with a little bit of slowness. That's basically the only, the only downside. I'll do my best to cover the major things though that we can do to help that. So first thing I wanna do is welcome you to Stellarium. And I think it's a great thing to just click around and look around and they, they put you in this little scene here with uh, you know, a little farmland and it's kinda of cute. A couple quick things that you wanna do first though is go over to the lower left hand corner and you wanna to go to location and you wanna make sure that the location is set near to where you live. So right now I have mine set to Lolo. Uh, in reality, I live in Missoula. It's just cause my computer's automatically setting that. As long as you're within 20 miles or so of where you actually live, this is gonna be more than enough accuracy to get you uh, some good suitable objects for the night. So that's fine for me. I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Then I'm gonna go over here to the date and time window. And this is where you can actually pick any date you want. So if you know you're going out two weeks from today, you can set it to two weeks from today and find suitable targets for that. In this case, I'm gonna look for tonight and I'm gonna to look tonight about 10 p.m. So I'm gonna go three hours forward in the future to 10, 18 p.m. And I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Now at this point, we get a view of the night sky as it's going to be at 10, 15 p.m. Now a couple important things you wanna pay attention to in Stellarium. Use it for things like telling you where the moon is, right? We've got the moon over here due east at around 10 p.m. We're gonna be fighting that tonight. So objects toward the eastern sky are probably not gonna be optimal tonight to shoot because we're gonna be battling the moon the whole time. So I'm gonna to wanna to stick over to the west hand half of the sky or up toward the zenith, somewhere where the, the moon is not going to be having as much of an effect on my images. Now, quick note on the moon, when you have a full moon or even a three quarter moon or really anything more than a half moon and you're using a DSLR and especially if you're in light polluted areas, it's probably one of those nights to focus on really bright objects, things like star clusters or uh, globular clusters, things that are very bright and you're not trying to pull out nebulae or any sort of galaxies. Just because the moon is gonna be hurting you, the light pollution is gonna be hurting you, it's not gonna be a good time to do it. So now that we've got the location set and the time set, the next thing I wanna do is look at how we configure what objects Stellarium shows us. And then I wanna go in and look at how we configure our equipment preferences so that we can actually see how much space our camera is gonna take up in the field of view on the screen. So the first thing I wanna do is go to this sky and viewing options in the lower left. And I wanna get this stuff configured. Now, most of this stuff's gonna stay the same. We're gonna go over to the DSO area because that's where we find our deep sky objects. And the first thing I'll point out is that there's this filter by type. So because tonight is a moon night, I might want to turn off every one of these except for star clusters because star clusters are gonna be our brightest objects that we have to work with. But for the, for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna leave everything on. I'm also gonna make sure that my favorite catalogs are on, which is IC, NGC, and, and Messier. I like those three catalogs the most. If you're used to other catalogs, you can turn those on or off here as well. Now, the next thing we wanna do is turn on labels and markers. 
and you'll see that automatically all over the sky you'll start getting little labels for all of the different deep sky objects that there are up there in the sky and you'll see that they're mostly centered around where the Milky Way is. Um, that's just kind of the way the world works. So what we're going to do is you can see that you can drag this label slider and the further you drag the label slider the more things will have labels. The further you drag the hints slider, the more little patterns and icons you will get for the different objects. So I like to keep those roughly the same amount so that there's no label-less objects. I like to have everything have a label. But the important thing, you guys, is down here there's this checkbox that says limit magnitude. And that is one of the most important checkboxes because what the magnitude of an object is, is it's how bright it appears to be to us as observers on Earth. And the reason that that's important is when we're shooting with a DSLR, or we're shooting with a um, kind of a, a starter astro setup, we're going to be limited in exposure to 30 seconds, or even if you don't have a tracker, maybe one or two seconds. If you have a tracker, you can maybe go to a minute. But whatever it happens to be, you're going to be very limited in exposure time. And because of that, it's important to stick to the brightest objects. Now, magnitude works opposite of what you might think. The higher the magnitude, the darker the object actually is. I think the sun's magnitude is like negative 30 or something. It's a very, very bright object because it's so close to us. It appears very bright to us. It's all apparent magnitude. But what I like to do is you'll see as I click this checkbox and I arrow down on this thing, as I go down, more objects will disappear. And I like to usually aim, if it's gonna be a moonlit night, man, I'm gonna go for like a magnitude of six or 6.25, somewhere in there because that's gonna limit us to very much only the brightest objects in the sky. And that's what we want. We don't wanna, especially if you're starting out, you don't wanna start off with some challenge because if you start off with a challenge, you're not gonna get much and you're gonna feel kinda of discouraged in this hobby. So I make sure my labels are on, I make sure my limiting magnitude is set, and then I like to make sure that my labels and markers are dragged all the way across to make sure that I'm seeing everything that fits my magnitude requirements down below. Now, if you only see one object with that magnitude, maybe increase it a little bit to give yourself a little bit dimmer of objects, but again, getting up to seven, eight, you're getting to the point where you're really gonna want some really long exposures to capture those objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this now. I've got the objects that I want in the sky, and you can see there's quite a few to pick from at a magnitude of six. Um, and I can scroll in and zoom in on some of these things. The scroll wheel on the mouse or two fingers on the trackpad will get you zoomed in on these. And you can see the North American Nebula is showing up. That's a great first target, it's very big. But basically anything with a label at this point is a bright enough object for us to image, supposedly. The second thing I wanna look at is field of view, because if you have a 135 millimeter lens and you're trying to shoot like some little tiny galaxy, you're not gonna meet much success. So to do that, we go up here to the upper right hand corner and we click this little gear or wrench with the circle around it. And that takes us into this oculars setting. And what I'm gonna do in here is we need to configure a couple things. We need to configure the sensor section and the telescope section. Uh, you might think lenses are what you want, but lenses is more for a, just a multiplic multiplicity factor. Uh, it's like a reducer or a focal uh, enhancer for, for your focal length. We're not really worried about that. We're worried about sensor and telescope. And you can see under sensors, I have my Alta U8300 in here. Um, on my other computer, I have my Fuji X h1 in here but you guys would basically what i recommend doing is going on to you know bnh's website or uh, dxo mark or one of the websites like that and filling out your resolution in pixels and x and y your width in millimeters for x and y and then your pixel width which is your pixel size in microns and you can calculate that really easily to get the pixel width it's basically just the width in millimeters divided by the resolution in pixels and you'll get that size so I like to type all of this stuff in, and then I go to the telescope section and I type in the focal length of my telescope and also the diameter. Uh, little pro tip, if you have a 70 to 200, let's say, and let's say you have a 200 millimeter lens and you're planning on using it at 200, if it's a 200 f 2.8, which is what you know most 70 to 200s are, I'm getting out my calculator right now to do a little bit of math. You would actually, to get the diameter of the lens, you might think that that's the filter size on the front, but it's a little different with Astro. If you need that diameter, you're gonna take 200 and you're gonna divide it by the F2.8. So you're gonna do 200 divided by 2.8 
and I get 71.4. So for a 70 to 200, the focal length would be 200 and the diameter would be 71. So pretty easy thing to do. Also a little side note, if you have a, uh, any sort of crop sensor camera, when you input your sensor information, Stellarium will take care of that for you. So you wanna type in the actual sensor information and your actual lens information and don't do any sort of crop factor calculations because Stellarium does that. And then you can name your lens, you can name your sensor, say name your telescope, name your sensor, and you can close this box. Now why this is cool is, you might be looking at the Andromeda galaxy being like, ooh, that looks like a scrumptious little thing to photograph. And what you can do is go up here to the upper right to this little box here and click on it and it will bring up a square and in the upper right you can actually scroll through your variety of sensors that you have if you have more than one i only have one in there and also your variety of telescopes and it will show you the different fields of view of your different devices and so we can see that if i tried to image andromeda with my uh, apogee alta u8300 and my stellar view telescope I'm actually gonna to have to crop off part of the Andromeda galaxy. So that might not be a wise choice. Um, I'll zoom back out, we can say like, let's see what NGC 7686 is. And it looks like it's probably a star cluster because uh, there's not a lot there. But we can basically just scroll around and see what is labeled here. Here's another star cluster, the M39 star cluster. We can kind of click around, look at North American Nebula. That is not going to be a great choice for me to image with my uh, this my current setup because it's so tight that my setup's not going to get the entirety of the North American Nebula. Those of you with DSLRs, this might be a perfect target because you have a 200 millimeter lens instead of a 480 millimeter lens. You might be able to get the entirety of the North American Nebula and get a perfect picture of it. But the point is you don't know until you set this stuff up. So I would get in Stellarium, set up your sensor size, set up your telescope size, set up your deep sky object settings so that it's only showing you those brightest objects. And together, you should be able to get a really good idea of some good objects to shoot during the night. Now, a couple little pro tips. Pro tip number one, plan for the moon. If the moon's out, it might not be a good night to shoot. It's just not, not great. Pro tip number two, pick objects near the zenith when you're gonna be shooting them. The higher the object is in the sky, the less atmosphere you're gonna to have to shoot through, and so inherently, you're gonna get better quality. It's just gonna be the way that it works. Step number three, or pro tip number three, plan for an object that will let you crop in a little bit on your final image. Reason being, lenses are really terrible toward the corners of the frame. So if you can crop in a little bit, you can not use the corners and you're gonna get better quality and rounder stars across the field of view for your final area. So those would be my tips. I think the biggest thing is I, I like to write down a lot of these objects once I do this once, that way I have it saved. One more little tip I'll say is go into the configuration window when you're all done with this stuff. And right here under the main section, I like to go to save view and save settings so that everything we did tonight is saved. So the next time you start Stellarium, you're good to go and you have all that information already in there. Otherwise, if you don't do this, next time you open Stellarium, there's no, ocu there's no uh, telescope setup, no sensor setup. All the deep sky objects are back to their default values. This is super important. So make sure you go in and do that. Hope you guys liked this video. If you did and you want more videos on Stellarium or on software, let me know down in the comments. Hit that like button if you guys liked it. Hit the dislike button if you didn't. Thank you guys for watching. I hope that I taught you something and that you are excited to go out and do some astrophotography. Thanks for watching, everybody. I appreciate it. You're awesome.